Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Today we are going to assemble some viruses. This is the last of this basic part of the course, replication of viruses. From now we move on to how viruses cause disease. So I hope you understand everything we've gone through so far. If not, ask questions, okay? Because if you don't understand what we've done, the second half of the course will be harder. Putting together viruses. There are a certain assembly of viruses occurs in a very ordered fashion. If it didn't, things would be a mess with viruses. So most viruses undergo a common set of assembly reactions, which are shown here. Remember, you have to make <clears throat> the viral proteins first, and you assemble them into structural units. That can be one or it can be several proteins. You have to assemble the shell. That happens spontaneously. You have to put the genome in the shell. Talk a little bit about how that happens. For some viruses, uh, an envelope is acquired, but not for all. That's why it's in blue. This, the virus has to be released from the host cell. And some viruses actually mature after they get out of the host cell. We'll talk of an example of that today. Now, the, the way viruses look can tell you a lot about how it's formed. You, can, you should be able to look at most of these viruses and tell me how it's formed. That would be a good question, don't you think? I could give you a picture of a virus and you say, tell me how this matures. So you could look at an enveloped virus and say it has to acquire its envelope by budding in some way, and we'll talk about that today. Uh, these guys here, icosahedral viruses, don't have to bud through anything. So you can learn a lot just by looking at the structure of the virus. You can tell how it's formed and even how it gets into a cell, because with envelopes, you know, we've talked about how fusion has to occur between the membranes and so forth. <clears throat> the structure of a virus has important consequences for the kinds of infections that can take place as well. It's not just a matter of looking at these nice structures. For example, here is a tail of two picornaviruses. Poliovirus and rhinovirus are both picornaviruses. They look very similar. The genomes are very similar. The particles or icosahedral particles look very similar, yet they have totally different pathogenesis. Poliovirus infects via the alimentary tract that goes through your stomach. Therefore, it's resistant to low pH, to alkaline pH to enzymes that it encounters in this passageway. A very structurally similar virus, rhinovirus, cannot infect the same way. It cannot go through the gut. It's destroyed. If you have a common cold and you swallow some of the viruses you're producing, and you do that from time to time, they will be completely inactivated as they pass through your stomach. It can only inf these viruses can only infect the respiratory tract where things are a little easier for a virus. So this, despite the, the structures, are exactly the same. So the details obviously can determine all of this. <clears throat> and remember, all viruses, all virions, are metastable. I can't emphasize that enough. They have to survive in the environment, uh, but they have to come apart upon infection. So they are built in a way that allows disassembly. This is a very interesting point because as you will see, the assembly pathways that lead to viruses, virion particles, are not reversible for the most part. So when you assemble, and that, that is what makes the quality control of assembly work, that it's a non-reversible pathway. Yet when the virus is made and it encounters some condition, it can come apart again. So obviously those conditions, you know, low pH in an endosome, cannot be encountered during assembly. Uh, the virus assembly also depends on the host cell, of course, as has almost every other aspect of virus replication. There are cell proteins that help to fold individual proteins, viral proteins, so that they fold properly, and glycosylation plays a role in that. Transport systems move virion components around the cell to the sites of assembly. Remember the same way that microtubules and other transport pathways brought viruses in, the same systems are going to bring proteins to where they need to go for assembly. Things don't diffuse, remember, in the cell. 
the secretory pathway will, be, will move membrane proteins from the ER to the plasma membrane. Uh, and the nuclear import and export machinery will move proteins in and out of the nucleus. And you'll see for some viruses, there are quite a series of complex import and export steps that have to occur uh, in order to get proper assembly. So all of these uh, steps depend on cell processes. Now, a key, a key aspect of assembly is that nothing happens fast in dilute solutions. Uh, things always have to be concentrated, and that's what viruses do in cells. They maintain their crucial components highly concentrated so that they assemble quickly. Uh, they are often visible in the microscope as a consequence. You can often look at an infected cell, and you can see concentrations of viral assembly products, uh, which for different viruses are characteristic of infection. We call these factories or inclusions. Um, <clears throat> internal membranes can also be used of, of the cell to concentrate proteins. We talked about how poliovirus during RNA synthesis concentrates the replication machinery on a vesicle. That's a form of concentration. Probably assembly also occurs on the same vesicles as well. Uh, here's an example of a inclusion body. This is a picture of a cell. It's infected with a virus, and these, this is, uh, these are the, sorry, these are the uh, inclusion bodies here, these darker staining bodies uh, around the nucleus. So there's one up there, 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 and there. Does anyone know what virus this is? You, if you were a pathologist, you could look at this and say it's probably this virus. I wouldn't expect any of you to know that. I can give you a hint, though. You get this by being bitten by a dog. Very good. Sorry, a rhabdovirus, a rabies virus. So this is a rabies virus infected cell, and these are called negri bodies by the Italian pathologist who discovered them many years ago. And if you see those in your cells, then you're in big trouble. Because that looks, doesn't look like any other virus infection, negri bodies. And every virus has its own characteristic uh, assembly pattern. So how do viruses get concentrated? To do this, uh, they can be produced in a compartment of a cell, which we call a factory or some localized site. Um, they can be protein-protein interactions uh, that are involved that help concentrate different parts of the assembly pathway. So you can make one subunit in a second, and they can interact in some way and, and concentrate them in a particular part of the cell. Uh, also, membranes can function to help concentrate components. So when things are associated with membranes, they become concentrated. So these are just a few of the ways that we achieve this state that pushes the reactions forward, not dilute. Uh, assembly also has to occur in the right place in the cell, the different steps of assembly. And this helps, this helps viruses be produced. It increases the rate of reactions, as we've just said, and it uh, restricts side reactions. So instead of having the proteins diffuse throughout the cell, they're concentrated in one place, the likelihood that they're gonna undergo the right reactions is increased. That's what we mean by restricting side reaction. We increase the specificity and the efficiency of, of assembly. Now remember, just as we were talking about in virus entry, moving in a cell is not a trivial problem. You cannot just diffuse, you have to be moved by active processes. So again, remember, the cell is a crowded place. Here's a snapshot of the cytoplasm with ribosomes and microtubules and all sorts of molecules floating around. To move distances, like from the plasma membrane to the sites of replication, requires transport systems such as the microtubule, uh, energy-dependent motor proteins on, on cytoskeletal tracts. That not only functions when viruses come in the cell, but it also functions to get viruses outside of the cell as well. Viral proteins also have addresses built into their structures that um, target them to the right places. And we have membrane proteins, for example, that go to the right membranes. There are addresses in the proteins that specify this. Signal sequences at the end terminus that directs the protein to the endoplasmic reticulum. Fatty acid modifications, as you'll see in some proteins, direct them to membranes. 
Uh, membrane proteins stay there because they have retention signals. ER retention signals keep proteins in the ER rather than going somewhere else. Nuclear proteins have nuclear localization sequences that target them to the nucleus. Um, <clears throat> viral mRNAs or ribonuclear protein complexes that are made in the nucleus go out into the cytoplasm because they have export signals associated with them. So this is what we mean by addresses built into the structure. Um, and capsids and protein complexes have directed <laughs> motion, as we've said. They don't just diffuse all around the cell. They're going to a very specific place. And that's because they move on tracks. Microtubules and intermediate filaments are the tracks that these proteins and assemblies move on. And these are the motor proteins that move them along. So you should sense something here that is obvious and that none of this is virus specific. All of this address information exists in the cell already. Viruses haven't invented anything. They're just co-opting systems for directing their proteins to the right place. Here's an example of localization of uh, viral proteins to the nucleus. Many viruses need to be there, not only to replicate their DNA, but also to assemble virus particles. We talked about the influenza virus requirement for the nucleus, which is unusual for an RNA virus. Um, <clears throat> the RNP that is produced um, has to be translated, the protein components have to be produced in the cytoplasm. So as you know, the ribosomes and the translation machinery is cytoplasmic. So if a protein needs to go into the nucleus, it has to be imported. This example is the influenza virus nuclear protein, which is one of the protein that coats the RNA genome. The RNA genome is produced in the nucleus. This NP has to go into the nucleus to coat it. The NP has on it an import signal so that it can get into the nucleus. Uh, here is an adenovirus protein, the hexon, which is one of the structural components of the capsid. The DNA of this virus replicates in the nucleus, so the structural components are imported into the nucleus and coalesce around the DNA. Same thing with polyomavirus, one of the small double-stranded DNA viruses. The structural proteins, again, are made in the cytoplasm and imported into the nucleus. All right, these are all these are all directionalities that are established because the viral genomes replicate in the nucleus. How about if you want a viral protein to be on the plasma membrane? Many viruses put them there so that they, as you will see, they can bud, form particles by budding. Uh, so to do that, you need to utilize the transport pathway of the cell. The proteins have to have a signal sequence that targets them uh, to the endoplasmic reticulum. They are produced in the lumen. They then move to the plasma membrane via the Golgi stacks. And on the way, they're glycosylated and modified in various ways. Uh, and eventually, they are delivered to the cell surface uh, by vesicles that butt off the Golgi and are transported on tracks, just like uh, other movements in the cell, up to the surface. So here are some viral glycoproteins coalescing at the cell surface, getting ready to receive uh, nucleic acids, as we'll see. So it's another example of the addresses that are important in targeting proteins to the right place. So let's talk about a couple of different strategies for making viruses. And one of the key concepts is that we're going to make sub-assemblies. We're not going to take 20 proteins and have them all come together at once. We're going to have a few proteins make one sub-assembly and a few make another, and then the sub-assemblies will come together, and each step is going to be irreversible. So we're going to look at three strategies here, and the first one is assembly from individual protein molecules. And the example here is simian virus 40, a, poly, a polyomavirus, uh, and this is one of our double-stranded DNA viruses, relatively small virions. The capsid is made up of VP1, VP2, and VP3. These proteins are translated from individual messenger RNAs in the cytoplasm, and they fold and then assemble to form the SV40 pentamer. So the pentamer has mostly VP1 and a little bit of VP2 and VP3. So this is an example of a subassembly then these are going to go on and form intact virions. So you make a lot of sub-assemblies and make the virion. And the key here, these are made from individual protein molecules. Another example is adenovirus, one of these larger DNA viruses with different proteins in the shell serving different functions. And remember, one of those proteins is the fiber that sticks out from each five-fold axis of symmetry. 
So we're looking at the assembly of the fiber and the, the base that it's attached to, the penton. So the, the f protein 4 is produced by translation of viral mRNAs. This, this becomes a trimer and folds to form the fiber. The base is a, a pentamer of protein 3. These are, fo these are, again, translated individually. They fold into the structure needed. And then five of these form the penton base. So then those two come together to form the penton, which consists of the fiber and the penton base. So again, an example of a subassembly. These eventually will go into constructing new virions, uh, and they're just made simply by making individual proteins. Do the subassemblies form just by amino acid interaction? Yeah. So these proteins have all the information in their structure to be able to fold into the right uh, configuration and also to associate with other proteins as well. In some cases, there are, there are chaperone proteins in the cell that help the folding, but most the information is in the amino acid sequence to dictate how this works, yeah. And here's a third strat another strategy for making, sorry, two strategies for making <coughs> subassembly. Uh, panel B, assembly from a polyprotein precursor. A number of viruses do this, including polio and other picornaviruses. The capsid protein is translated as a long precursor. The capsid proteins are VP1, 2, 3, and 4. These are made as a precursor. It then folds by itself. Uh, and then again, the, the information for this folding is built into the amino acid sequence. So here we have P1 made, it folds. And then these loops that join the capsid protein together are clipped by a viral protease, and that gives you the mature structural unit here, which happens to sediment at 5S. And that is a subassembly. That will go on to be joined with others of its same kind to make the capsid. The difference here is that the protein is produced as a polyprotein, not individual proteins as we saw in the previous examples. Now, sometimes, as I said, you need chaperones to help the folding run properly. There's even some evidence, maybe for, for polio, that you need a chaperone to help this fold correctly, this polyprotein precursor. But here's a, a well-described example of the assembly of a adenovirus hexon, which is a trimer of protein 2. The hexon is one of the main building blocks of the capsid. The hexons and the pentons build the capsid. The pentons are at the five-fold axes, and the hexons are elsewhere. Uh, protein 2 is made from a single mRNA. It assumes a conformation. And then to trimerize, it requires a chaperone, which is another viral protein called L4. So this helps the three monomers uh, associate with one another. They can't do it on their own. So the monomers can fold into, into this monomer. The, the polypeptide chains can fold into a monomer, but they can't trimerize without this viral chaperone. And sometimes cellular proteins serve chaperone functions as well. Okay, so those are examples of making a subassembly. Let's take one of these examples all the way through from the beginning to the end and see how uh, virus particles are made. So this is uh, the example. The example used here is poliovirus. These are, are of course, icosahedral virions. We're looking at the entire infectious cycle here. The receptor binding, internalization of the RNA into the cell, translation into proteins. Remember, this is a polyprotein, so it's cleaved by viral proteinases. The very end terminus of the polyprotein, called P1, encodes the four capsid proteins, VP1 through 4. We just saw on a previous slide how those associate, how those fold and are cleaved to form this 5S st structural unit. Five of these then come together to make what we call pentamers. So they happen to sediment at 14S. But the real important point here is that there are five subunits that make a pentamer. You can see those here nicely. And eventually, those pentamers will come together to form the intact capsid. Twelve pentamers will come together to make the capsid. So that's an example. You start with a 5S subassembly. You make a pentamer, which is another kind of a subassembly. And from the pentamers, you make viruses. Each of these assembly steps is irreversible. Uh, so you make good 5S units, you make a good pentamer, that's it. You can't take the pentamer and get 5S subunits back out of it. 
in the same way as if you make uh, the, the capsid from the pentamers, you can't reverse that. Now, an interesting question is how the RNA gets into this, because I'm, I'm telling you that these pentamers form a capsid. And what we think is that the RNA actually binds the pentamer, and that helps it encapsidate. But that's a little bit speculative. So the packaging of the genome, and we'll talk more about packaging a bit later, isn't really worked out. What I want to show you this as an example of is a sequential stepwise capsid assembly using subassemblies. Okay. <clears throat> Here's another example of this assembly line concept taken to a greater extreme because this is a more complex virus. This is a bacteriophage. You see, here's the end product. This is, a, this is a tailed bacteriophage. These are characterized by having a head, which is a capsid, an icosahedral capsid. The nucleic acid is in there. And then it has a, a, a neck and some tail fibers. And the DNA is injected through the base plate here. The, the phage lands on the bacteria, interacts with receptors. And then the DNA, this, there's a structure on the, the plate here that actually pokes a hole in the bacterial wall. and then the DNA is injected through. These are made as components. So the tail is made separately. This could be Ford Motor Company, right? The tail is made separately. These are all the proteins that go into making the base plate. Uh, and then you make the shaft, and then you put these rings around it. And uh, there you go. That's, that's one person's job to make the, uh, the tail assembly. And then the head, same way, you, you assemble an icosahedral protein, uh, excuse me, an icosahedral shell, and you're adding additional proteins at each step. That's then attached to the neck or the tail. And then finally, you make the tail fibers and put those on. So three different subassemblies with complex steps. And the key here, too, is also that all of these are irreversible. And that assures that they flow forward. Uh, if you make the proper assembly, if you make the right base plate, it flows through the pathway. If it's not correct, if it's aberrant in some way, it, does no it no longer goes through the pathway. It's discarded and recycled. So that's the assembly line concept with subassemblies. That's why I say you don't make, I don't know, there are 50 or 60 proteins here. You don't make them all and they all come together to make a virus particle. That's not how it works. They're done in very precise steps. So. Assembly line mechanisms make sure you make the virus in the right sequence of events. You make discrete structures, and quality control is the key. You can't make this unless you have this. Right? So you make sure that every step of the way works. <coughs> Let's look at how another kind of virus is assembled. Uh, this one in the nucleus. This is a herpes virus. And as you know, this is a virus with a rather large double-stranded DNA genome. That genome replicates in the nucleus. Uh, so here's, here's the nucleus right here. Most of the slide here, these are nuclear pore complexes. The cytoplasm is out here. So the genome replicates in the nucleus, and that's where the particles are going to be assembled. So the particles, of course, are made of proteins of different sorts. Those are translated in the cytoplasm. They have to be imported into the nucleus. And so here we're showing the import a variety of components that are important for assembly of this herpes virus. We have uh, VP26, we have some VP5 pentamers, we have some other proteins here as well. And then we have our portal. If you remember, there's one portal per virion uh, through which the DNA goes uh, in and out. Now, these are very large virions, and in fact, they're very difficult to make. Uh, as empty capsid. So what is done is that a scaffold is built first, and then the capsid is built around it. You know what a scaffold is on a building, right? It's those metal things they put on the outside so that they can then bring the building up. <laughs> Same idea, except here the scaffold is interior. It's really clever. You can't just build the shell. It would fall apart. So you build a protein scaffold. You build the capsid around it. All these capsid proteins are then assembled. This is an icosahedral shell. And then inside there is also a viral protease, which then, when the whole thing is complete, digests away the scaffold. So that's what we see here. VP24 protease digests away the scaffold. So now it's empty here, but it's stable because it's all been built. And then we can pump the DNA in. So the DNA goes in through a portal. And there you see the DNA all coiled inside the capsid. So these scaffolding proteins establish 
transient structures. They're not there permanently. And the viral protease packaged in them become activated to get rid of the scaffold at one point. This, of course, is a nucleocapsid. It's eventually going to be enveloped. It's going to acquire several envelopes on its way out of the cell. So that's an example, again, of a, of a virus that's assembled in the nucleus. Here's another example. This is adenovirus. Same idea. The virus has to assemble in the nucleus. That's where the viral DNA replicates. It's just a slightly different um, sequence of events. There's no scaffolding necessary for this virus. It's slightly smaller than the herpes viruses. But again, the DNA is in the nucleus. It's this blue double-stranded chain here. You have to import all the proteins that you need to build virions. You need hexon trimers. You need the penton, which we talked about, and other virion proteins as well. All of these are produced in the cytoplasm. They're imported. And what you do for adenovirus is you build an empty capsid, and then the DNA gets imported into it. And that produces eventually the mature virion. There are a variety of steps here which aren't important for you to, to know at all. The fact here is that you make an empty capsid without a scaffold, and then you import the DNA. The DNA, by the way, is complex with a variety of proteins, which are these guys here. You can see them complex to the DNA. Eventually, you get uh, the mature virion. I like to show this slide because I like the young virion. We used to have a colleague named Hamish Young. And guess what virus he worked on? Adenovirus. But he didn't name this particle, right? I think someone named it in his honor. No, it has nothing to do with him. But I always think of him when I talk about it. So a lot of these assembly steps are, they occur on their own. The information for assembly is built into the amino acid sequence. But some of them need, a, need help. They need chaperones. So we have self, an example of self-assembly is HIV capsid proteins. If you express the capsid protein precursor in cells, that would be the gag protein. Those form particles. You don't need anything else. Just express that protein, you will make empty particles. If you express the influenza hemagglutinin just by itself in cells, that will cause budding in the formation of virus-like particles. So two examples of how particles can be made on their own. They also the hepatitis B surface antigen, if you express just by itself in the cells, it will make particles. Examples of assisted assembly, these are viruses that can't uh, assemble on their own. Uh, proteins and nucleic acid genomes are needed as, as scaffolds or chaperones. So we saw an example of that with herpes virus, where you needed a scaffold in the interior. So you can't make a particle just by expressing the capsid proteins. You need to have the scaffolds as well. And adenovirus needs the uh, genome. Uh, let's look now at the budding of, of viruses. This is influenza virus maturation. And this is a process of called concerted assembly. So in all the examples we've looked at so far, there's been a sequence of events that occur. You make a subassembly, another subassembly, and so forth. So it's a sequential process. Here, everything comes together at once. You make subassemblies, and then at one point, they all come to form a particle. So an influenza virus, of course, is enveloped and has membrane glycoproteins. So those have to be placed in the plasma membrane via the secretory pathway. So uh, ribosomes translate the mRNAs encoding the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase on the ER. And these are transported up to the plasma membrane. And those uh, are, in, are embedded in the membrane right here. Underneath it is the viral genome, which you remember is in eight pieces. So only one of the pieces is shown here for clarity. This viral RNA is made in the nucleus. So remember, from the negative strand genome, we make messenger RNAs. These go out into the cytoplasm to make proteins. We replicate that negative strand through a positive strand intermediate. So now we have more negative strands, which are going to be packaged into new virus particles. That's still in the nucleus. In order to get out of the nucleus, you have to put a protein or proteins on this RNA. And in fact, uh, several proteins, uh, NEP and M1, are made in the cytoplasm. They're imported. They attach to the RNA. And they form the ribonucleoprotein complex. And that can then be exported. These 
this protein here, NEP. NEP stands for nuclear export protein. It has to be bound to the RNA in order for it to come out of the nucleus. If that protein isn't present, the RNA would just stay in the nucleus. So now we have our viral RNP, ribonucleoprotein. It is the RNA bound with all the proteins that it would need in a new infection to, to initiate infection. It is also has this M1 protein bound to it. That's going to be a structural protein. It goes to the plasma membrane where the viral glycoproteins are, and the whole structure buds out and forms a particle. This is basically a pinching off of a membrane segment. I believe we'll look at this a bit later. So the result is viral RNAs. Again, we're only showing two here with all the proteins they need and the M1 uh, protein, which forms a shell on the inside of the glycoprotein, of the lipid envelope. Now, the viral HA, which is targeted to the plasma membrane, you remember it's one of these glycoproteins in the particle. We know the structure of the HA. Remember, it is a fibrous, has, comprises a fibrous stem with a globular head. The head has the receptor binding site. The receptor is sialic acid. It fits right in the head here. Here's a linear portion uh, or a linear diagram of this protein on the bottom. So this is the hemagglutinin in a schematic of it. It's embedded in the viral membrane right here. It could be cellular membrane. So you see it has a transmembrane sequence. It has a signal sequence at the N-terminus. That targets it to the ER so it can get out into the plasma membrane. <clears throat> it has a variety of disulfide bonds that maintain its structure. It is, has sites for addition of sugars, glycosylation sites. These assist in the proper folding of the protein as it's produced in the endoplasmic reticulum has the fusion peptide here. Remember, this is going to be cleaved eventually right here, so the fusion peptide will be exposed when this undergoes the low pH shift in the endosome. So you see a number of signals which are important for the maturation of this protein. One other um, site here on the C-terminus, the part of the protein that's actually either in the cytoplasm or in the interior of the virion is actually conjugated with lipids like palmitate, and other similar lipids. <clears throat> when this protein is produced uh, in, by ribosomes bound to the endoplasmic reticulum, it has a signal sequence at the end terminus which directs it to the ER lumen. The protein is then threaded into the lumen. The, the signal sequence is shown here. It's clipped off. The protein is threaded into the lumen. It remains bound uh, to the ER membrane, as you can see here. And you see the very C terminus of the protein. That orange bit is lipid. Um, it is a particular lipid that is linked to the protein and which is important for having this protein being able to go back and bind into the membrane. And it turns out that that's very important for assembly and infectivity of these particles. As this protein moves uh, through the ER and then the Golgi stacks, it becomes, uh, it, it forms multimers. It's glycosylated in a variety of ways. You can see here all the different sugars that are added on as it passes through. In the late Golgi, it is cleaved by proteases, so that gives you an active protein, and then eventually it will be shipped out via vesicles to the plasma membrane. So this is a typical path for a, a membrane-bound uh, glycoprotein. This is another example of the maturation of an envelope virus. This is a retrovirus, and I want to show you this because there's a different step that happens here, which is illustrative. Um, retroviral RNAs are produced in the nucleus, remember. They are produced by transcription of that proviral DNA copy with Sitchin chromosomal DNA. So here is a uh, retroviral mRNA coming out of the nucleus, the RNA genome. So it's an mRNA or the RNA genome. It becomes bound with a number of proteins that are produced as a precursor and then cleaved. Here is a schematic of the GAG precursor protein. Remember, these viruses are called a GAG protein, which is a structural precursor, a PAL protein, which is the reverse transcriptase, RNA-SH integrase, and an envelope, which is the glycoprotein. So this is just the GAG portion. And this contains a number of individual proteins. You can see here they're all released by processing by a viral proteinase. So these are, these are all produced by translation. They fold into a characteristic structure, and some of them associate with the viral RNA. 
Now here in white is NC, nucleocapsid. This is a protein that binds specifically to the viral RNA. You can see here it is binding the RNA and eventually it will direct the RNA to the membrane. Uh, another part of this precursor is matrix MA in blue. Matrix targets these, these proteins to the plasma membrane. We'll see how that happens in a moment. So all these proteins are together and they're serving different functions. NC is binding RNA. Matrix is bringing the whole thing to the membrane. CA is the capsid protein. This will eventually form the shell around the genome. And that's the brown one. So those are all brought in to this budding structure. So here you can see uh, RNAs bound to NC. We have a molecule of capsid, which is brown. And then the blue ones are the matrix. So go up here, the matrix targets it to the plasma membrane. They form this nice array at the membrane. And remember, sequential assembly at the membrane. This is helping to concentrate these components. This whole thing begins to bud out. Of course, the glycoproteins have already been shipped up to the plasma membrane. These are encoded by the envelope gene. Uh, they're right here. So now we're forming a particle by budding. This, if this were influenza virus, this particle would be done, but it's not. This is a retrovirus. This particle's not finished. There is a protease in here, which after the budding occurs, acts to cleave viral proteins and matures the capsid. So you can see this is the final mature capsid. The brown protein is capsid protein. This forms an icosahedral shell. And that only assembles in its final form after the virus has budded off. So it's an example of a virus that matures after it's released from the cell. OK? And that's why in one of those first slides, we had at the bottom of that scheme maturation after the virus was released from the cell. Yes? Okay, the difference between NC and MA, NC is nucleocapsid. This binds the RNA specifically. Matrix is associated with NC and capsid. That's the blue protein, but matrix doesn't by itself bind the RNA. It interacts with these other proteins. The matrix is, has affinity for the membrane. That's what brings the, the complex up to the plasma membrane, okay? All right, so this is a schematic of the envelope glycoprotein of two different retroviruses. It's basically very similar to the influenza virus HA. These are transmembrane glycoproteins. We have glycosylation sites. There are cleavage sites. Those big triangles are cleavage sites because you have to have an N-terminal fusion protein. But remember, you want to keep it buried near the viral membrane until it's ready to fuse. Um, and then at the end terminus, you have a signal sequence. The protein looks sort of like this in the final uh, version in the virus. The cleavage separates it into two pieces called TM for transmembrane. That remains attached to the membrane. And SU for surface. They are held together by a disulfide bond, so they do stay together. And the SU portion will eventually bind the receptor. And remember, that receptor binding will help expose the fusion peptide, which is buried. So you see why you have to cleave this. Otherwise, the N-terminal would, the N-terminus, sorry, if you didn't cleave it, the fusion peptide would not be accessible. Now, many viral proteins are modified with lipids. We, we saw one example with influenza virus, where the C-terminus of the HA was modified by a lipid. I think it's palmitate, but I'm not sure. Uh, and that helped direct the C-terminus to embed in the membrane, which is apparently important. These are just examples of some other lipids that can be uh, included. You don't have to learn any of these. You don't have to learn the structure. Uh, you, you don't even have to know the individual names. You just need to know that some viral proteins can be modified with lipids, and they have specific functions. So here's the modification with myristate, myristate on the first amino acid of a protein. Uh, and here is modification with Farnesol. And other, um, this allows you to target proteins to various membranes without having a signal sequence. So remember, a signal sequence targets a protein to the, to the secretory pathway, it makes the protein go into the ER and eventually move up to the plasma membrane. 
maybe you don't want to go in that pathway. Well, you put a lipid in, like one of these, and it can target it to other membranes. Uh, so in this case, you can make the protein in the cytoplasm and then put the lipid on, and it will go wherever the lipid is telling it to go. So it doesn't have to enter that secretory pathway. So these are two of the lipids that are acid. There's some others, uh, geranil, geranol, or palmitate are other lipids that can be added to viral proteins. So here's an example of a modification of a viral protein with lipid. Here is the gag protein of a retrovirus, matrix, capsid, nucleocapsid proteins, which we've talked about. The matrix protein at its end terminus is modified with myristate or myristic acid. It's a fatty acid. So that is right at the end terminus of the protein. And here's an expanded view of that protein right here. If you change this sequence at which myristate is attached, you block the ability of this protein to associate with the cytoplasmic face of the plasma membrane. So remember I told you that the matrix protein of these retroviruses targets these, the growing subassembly to the plasma membrane. The reason it does so is because it has myristic acid at its end terminus, and that allows it to go to the plasma membrane. And if you mutate the sequence so uh, the myristate cannot be attached, which is easy to do, uh, you block assembly and budding. So this is totally essential for assembly and budding because it directs the matrix protein to the plasma membrane. Okay. Here we have some other information about RNA binding. I told you that NC is the nucleocapsid protein which binds RNA and it does so because it has specific sequences that interact with RNA. Okay, so those are just some principles about uh, targeting of proteins for budding viruses. All viruses, of course, have to get genomes into the capsid, and they do that in a variety of ways. This is called genome packaging. We've talked about packaging a genome inside the capsid. And the key point here is that you have to just package viral genomes you don't want to package cellular genomes. That would be a waste of a nice capsid because you can't do anything with that cellular genome. So you have to be able to distinguish cellular uh, DNA or RNA from the viral RNA. And these, of course, are all nucleic acid molecules, so you have to have a specific way of distinguishing the viral from the cellular molecules. And here's an example of the level of um, distinguishing that occurs retrovirus genomes, mRNAs, are less than 1% of the total RNA in the cytoplasm of a cell. Yet, every, pretty much everything that's packaged into particles is viral RNA. So there's not a lot of viral RNA in the cytoplasm, but somehow the budding machinery can find that viral RNA in a sea of cellular mRNAs. So that's the, that derives from very specific mechanisms. And these are called packaging signals. There are sequences in the genome that are needed for incorporation of the nucleic acid into particles. And usually you find these genetically. You mutate parts of the genome until the genome is not packaged, or you take what you think is a packaging sequence and put it on a totally different nucleic acid and show that that other nucleic acid can be packaged. And as a result, a number of these have been identified in, in various viruses. So let's go through some of those and figure out how they work. Here are packaging sequences from two viral DNA genomes. Uh, at the top, adenovirus type 5. Here is um, the left end of the genome, and we have the E1A region right here. This is a promoter in red shown here. Just for reference, this is one of the inverted terminal repeats of the genome. So that's the left end of the genome. And these blue arrows are all packaging sequences. These are sequences that are essential for packaging of this DNA into the adenovirus capsid. Somehow they are recognized in the assembly process and allow the genome to be specifically packaged and not, bar, uh, not cellular DNA, for example. You can take this piece of DNA and put it on another piece of DNA, and that will get into the capsid. So there are multiple packaging sequences here. Below is SV40, the, the double-stranded DNA genome, which we talked about in terms of not only DNA replication, but 
uh, RNA synthesis. And you can see a lot of the features here that were referred to in other lectures, the enhancer, the SP1 binding sites, the origin of replication in the early transcription unit. And embedded within them is the packaging signal. So you can see the packaging signal comprises this area from here to here. It overlaps with the enhancer and the ORI and the SP1 site. So this is typical of these smaller viruses where you have overlaps of function. So again, this is a sequence needed for incorporation of this viral DNA into the capsid. If you take it away, if you mutate it, and it's just a small piece, as you can see here, if you take it away, the viral DNA will not be incorporated. So here's one model for how the herpes virus genome is packaged. The herpes virus also genome also has packaging sequence. You remember, this is a double-stranded DNA. It's shown at the top. And here's an, an expansion of the left end below it. And these sequences, the direct repeats, the DR1 and 2, and the PAC1 and the PAC2, these are all sequences involved in packaging of the viral DNA into capsids. Now, you remember, herpes virus capsids are assembled with the, sh with the scaffold inside. Then the scaffold is digested away by a viral protease. And then the viral genome is put in through the portal. So there's an opening at one fivefold axis where the viral genome goes in. The genome replication produces concatamers with head-to-tail copies of the genome. So you have head-to-tail, then another one head-to-tail, head-to-tail, all linked together. They're just long copies of the genome. And what happens is these are recognized by a complex of proteins, including the portal. So these packaging sequences here, the PAC1 and the PAC2, they're, all, they're over here in this figure in the upper right. Uh, they are recognized by the portal as well as some other viral proteins. And then the DNA is, is threaded into the capsid at the portal. The portal actually actively pulls the DNA in. So that won't happen unless the, there are these packaging sequences at the left end of the genome, because they have to be recognized by this set of proteins. So the portal pulls in the genome until it reaches another set of packaging sequences. So you can see here on this concatamer, here's one copy of the DNA and here's another. You have uh, multiple, se multiple copies of this packaging sequence. So the DNA is pulled in until the second set of packaging sequences is encountered. The specific sequences are recognized by the portal and associated proteins. The DNA is then cleaved, and that gives you a single unit of viral DNA in the capsid. Okay, so the portal and associated proteins recognize the packaging single. They pull in a single unit of DNA defined by the next packaging sequence that they encounter, and also until the head is filled up. So there's a certain size of DNA that can fit in the head. When the head is full and the second packaging sequence is encountered, the DNA is clipped, and now you have a mature virion full of DNA. Again, the packaging sequences are important for that. How about RNA genomes? How does this work? Similar ideas. You have specific sequences that are needed for packaging. Uh, this is a retrovirus packaging sequence. Let's start with the upper right here. This is the left-hand end of um, two retroviral genomes, a, an avian leukosis virus genome, a bird retrovirus, and a mouse retrovirus genome. So here's, an M, here's a full-length mRNA. This could be a genome uh, mRNA. There's a packaging sequence right here, the psi symbol. Um, that allows the full-length genome to be packaged. The other, I mean, if you remember, the envelope protein cannot be translated from the full-length mRNA. Uh, what has to happen is that you have a splice to remove this sequence in the middle, so then you have the N-terminal piece joined to the envelope, and that can then be translated. So the splicing event removes this packaging sequence. So envelope messenger RNAs are not packaged, only the full-length mRNA is packaged because they have that psi sequence, okay? For this virus, the psi sequence is uh, upstream of the splice site. So that is actually present in both full-length RNAs and envelope RNAs, but only the full length is packaged. So there's something else going on here that we don't understand. So this is necessary for packaging, 
but apparently why the envelope is excluded we don't understand. So that's a very specific psi or packaging signal that directs <laughs> packaging of full-length RNAs. What does that look like? Here is the psi sequence from HIV-1. And here we are at the left-hand end of the genome. Um, here is um, the psi sequence right here. You can see it's about 100 nucleotides long, and it's extensively folded. This is necessary for packaging of HIV RNA, although by itself it's not enough. Other sequences are needed. So if you took this sequence and put it into another RNA, it wouldn't, that would not get packaged into HIV particles. But if you take this Maloney psi sequence and put it into a different RNA, that will be packaged. So this is necessary and sufficient. This is necessary but not sufficient. So this is an extensively folded sequence, as you can see. And what we think happens is that two of them interact to form what's called a kissing loop complex. So these are the, these are the individual loop here, SL1, of the two packaging sequences. Uh, these red areas are believed to base pair. And that base paired structure is then the substrate for packaging. So the individual RNAs cannot be packaged, only two of them. Remember, the retroviral RNA uh, is actually two pieces in the capsid. And so this brings the two genomes together, and that is recognized as, as being packageable. <clears throat> Here's another way to look at that. Here's one RNA genome, and this is the packaging sequence shown right here. If you put two of them together, you get dimeric RNA. These are forming these kissing interactions here. Uh, this now produces binding sites for the viral nucleocapsid protein, and C and that allows the viral RNA to be incorporated into virions. All right, so the packaging signal is essential for binding of NC, which in turn is needed for packaging. But you can only get this NC binding site expressed if you have two viral RNAs making this kissing interaction via the uh, packaging sequence. So two examples of how uh, an RNA sequence could direct packaging. Another consideration uh, for packaging is that there is what's called a packaging limit. There is typically a limit on the size of nucleic acid that you can put into, especially an icosahedral capsid. Remember, icosahedra have fixed internal volumes. So there is a little space in, the, in most capsids for putting extra sequences, but it's not limit, unlimited because the capsids cannot expand. So you typically have a 5 or 10% uh, extra that you can put in. So with these icosahedral viruses, if you want to put genes in for gene therapy, you really need to take out some sequence because you can't fit enough in for a, for a gene. So that's one thing, packaging limits. Some viruses, um, like polio, we have never been able to find a packaging signal. No one has ever been able to do that. So we don't know why these viruses always have just viral RNA in them, not cellular RNA. One idea is that the packaging occurs on these membrane vesicles, which is where RNA replication occurs. If you remember from our talking about RNA synthesis, the viral RNA polymerase is on a vesicle, and it's very concentrated there, and it could be that that is where packaging occurs because there's no other RNA present on that vesicle. So that may be where the specificity comes from, from being on a vesicle. So there are a number of viruses for which we don't have such signals, and that may explain uh, the packaging. How about segmented RNA genomes? This is a special problem because if you have a virus with 8 or 10 or 12 pieces, how do you make sure that the virions get one of each and not two of one and three of another? They wouldn't be infectious. Okay, One copy of each segment. It's an interesting problem. So there are two mechanisms that have been proposed. There's a random mechanism and a selective mechanism. So random means that the virus just grabs eight segments at one time. It doesn't matter. And eventually, you'll get one virus in so many that's infectious, right? And, and selective means there's a binding site on the segment for specific genome segments. So if you did a random mechanism with influenza virus, which has eight segments, you would get one infectious particle out of every 400 assembled. So basically, 399 would be garbage because they would have they would be missing a segment or two or more, and one would be infectious. 
And that is actually close to the known particle to PFU ratio of the virus. Remember, particle to PFU ratio, you look at all the particles of a virus and you ask which ones are infectious. For flu, it's about 1 in 400. So it could be that there's a random mechanism going on here. But um, if, if 12 segments are packaged, 10% of the particles would contain a complete genome. So you could put a lot of pack segments in and you could get even more uh, infectivity than 1 in 400. We don't know if this actually occurs or not. More recently, there, there's some evidence that there are specific sequences on each RNA segment that says put this one into the capsid, put RNA 1, 2, 3, and 4, and not 10 of RNA 1 or 8 of RNA 1, specific sequences. So if you, if you take a cross-section of virions that are maturing from cells, this is what you see. And um, the point here is that you can see the viral RNAs are very, um, in a very regular pattern here. So they're all, they all look like they're standing uh, top to bottom as shown in this model right here. Okay, so you see the one, two, three, four, five, six, eventually there are eight RNAs. You can't see them all in this section. But they seem to be very ordered in the particle. So the model has arisen is that at the ends of each RNA, there are specific sequences that, that interact with the viral proteins as this particle is budding. And they put each RNA in a very specific place in the capsid. And each RNA has a signal that directs it to the particle. You can't have more than one of each segment in the particle as a consequence. So there's some genetic and here uh, physical evidence that that's the case. There is an example of selective packaging in, ba in a bacteriophage. It's called Phi6. It has three double-stranded RNA segments. All right? They're called S, M, and L. Now, this is very neat. The S goes in first into the capsid. You can't do anything else until you have S in there. Then M comes in, but only if S is present. And then finally, L requires the presence of S plus M. So this is a selective packaging mechanism. There's only one way you can put the RNAs in, S, L, uh, sorry, S, M, and L. And if you don't have S, you don't start the process. So this, you would predict from this that every particle is infectious. And in fact, the particle to PFU ratio of this virus is 1. So it does a good job of making infectious particles. And it seems to be because of this serial dependence of packaging. OK? Finally, let's talk about how viruses get envelopes. Um, Sometimes this happens after internal structures are assembled, as with influenza virus, and we'll talk about that. Uh, or um, it may happen as internal structures assemble. These are four separate strategies for acquiring an envelope. This could be any membrane. Uh, here we have. Um, a situation where the envelope glycoproteins and the capsid are both essential for budding. So you have to express both the capsid, which is shown in yellow here, and the glycoproteins, and you get a particle. So that's one. Here we have an example where the internal proteins drive budding. So either the matrix protein, the MA, or the gag protein of retroviruses will on their own drive budding. You don't need to have any glycoproteins present. Here we have envelope proteins driving budding. Flu is an example of that. You can express just the HA and get budding. Uh, and then finally, a more complex scenario where the matrix protein will drive budding, but you need additional proteins, such as the glycoproteins and the RNA, even for, addition, for efficiency and accuracy. So these are the ways that envelope viruses mature <laughs> at various membranes and the kinds of proteins that are needed to do each step. And we looked at this already for, for influenza virus, how subassemblies are made. Uh, we make the RNA assembly. We put the plasma membrane glycoproteins up, and that buds off to, to form a particle. And again, with influenza, you could drive this budding just by the synthesis of HA in cells. Uh, but in fact, in an infected cell, there is sufficient RNP that the particles that come off um, contain the viral genomes. The influenza virus M1, just like um, 
the matrix protein of um, the retroviruses is targeted to the plasma membrane by hydrophobic regions. So there's an N-terminal hydrophobic region on the M1 protein. There are also regions that bind the RNA. So remember, here's the M1 protein bound to the RNA, and then the M1 is going to target the plasma membrane. So what brings it there are these hydrophobic sequences on the N-terminus, and of course the RNA is bound here. Same goes for vesicular stomatitis virus, M protein, which is also a submembrane protein. You have N-terminal hydrophobic regions. Uh, sorry, we have N-terminal charged regions that bind to the RNA, and then a more internal hydrophobic region for membrane binding. So another way of explaining how we target these subassemblies to the budding complex. So that's why we don't get just empty particles made. You would think, while well, you're making HA, why don't we just butt off empty particles? Because this association of the RNP is very efficient. And the same goes for retroviruses. We discussed this already, but I want to make the point is that if you just synthesize the gag protein alone, this is sufficient to make virus particles. But the, when you do have RNA present, the RNA efficiently associates with the gag protein via that NC protein, and so that the virus particles that are made contain the genome. If you just make gag by itself, you will get particles. But when RNA is present, those are selectively incorporated into the particles. Now, uh, a very interesting understanding of the budding process came uh, about five or six years ago when uh, amino certain amino acid changes in the gag protein, remember the structural pre precursor, were shown to cause a budding arrest at a late stage. So these are examples of mutations that the virus would start to bud and then it would arrest at this stage. So here's an example of that over here and here. So the virions are on the surface. They're almost fully matured, but they're stuck by this stalk and they never come off. And this is because they have amino acid changes uh, in the gag protein. And these regions that accommodated these changes were called late domains because they had a late effect in virus maturation. Um, these have subsequently been found in many plus and minus strand RNA viruses. And the idea is these domains defined by these mutations, the L domains, they bind cell proteins that are involved in vesicle trafficking. So you know the the, the entry of vesicles into cells by endocytosis, the exit of vesicles to secrete material, that trafficking is all mediated by a very involved cellular system, which involves a variety of proteins. And viruses have tacked on to that system by interacting with those proteins via these L domain containing proteins to get their virions butted out. And this was discovered by mutating these proteins and finding this phenotype. And these are just examples of these L domains. So again, these are domains in viral proteins. If you change them, you block the budding of viruses. So for example, retroviruses, these are all different retroviruses here that infect different species. They have L domains of different kinds. They have oval-shaped ones and diamond-shaped ones and shaded ones. They're all over the protein. Ebola and Marburg viruses have L domains uh, in, in their uh, viral proteins. So do rabies viruses and arena viruses. And they're, they're different sequences here. You can see the motifs, uh, proline, threonine, serine, alanine, proline, et cetera. So they're three different ki kinds of L domains. So again, if you mutate one of these amino acids in this L domain, you arrest budding at a late stage. That's the definition of an L domain. These L domains interact with cell proteins that are involved in vesicle trafficking. So the trafficking of vesicles in cells has been dissected exquisitely in both yeast and in mammalian cells. And these are some of the protein complexes that are important for vesicle budding out of cells and for vesicles coming into cells by endocytosis. And these are the way the L domains interact with these proteins. These PTAP, LXXL, FL, PPXY, these are viral L domain sequences. And they specifically interact with these cellular proteins that are involved in vesicle budding. So the virus, in order to bud, has latched onto these proteins. And this helps pull them out of the cell. So in, in normal cells, uninfected cells, this is called the escort machinery, by the way, that 
the cell protein machinery is here that help direct vesicle traffic in and out of the cell. There are three different kinds of um, membrane abscission that are all related that involve this pathway. So normally in cells, uh, taking up vesicles from the surface. Uh, here we have a vesicle at the plasma membrane invaginating uh, and coming into the cell. Uh, and these, the formation of these vesicles requires this escort protein pathway. When cells divide, uh, here are two cells about to divide. This middle section here has to break. It's sort of like when a virus buds from the cell surface, the, two, the, the bud has to pinch off. Well, when cells divide, this has to pinch off as well. These escort proteins are involved in that as well. And here we have virus budding from the cell, and the escort pathway, the proteins are also involved in that as well. So we, the mechanisms are yet to be elucidated, but just starting with mutations in these viral glycoproteins identify their interaction with this machinery that's needed for vesicle traffic. So this is how viruses bud from cells by latching on uh, to this escort pathway. Very interesting. Now, where do viruses bud? I told you a couple of examples of budding from the plasma membrane, but they can virtually bud from any membrane in the cell. Uh, herpes buds through the nuclear membrane. Coronaviruses bud into the ER. Bunyaviruses bud into the Golgi. Uh, so Golgi, ER, plasma membrane, nuclear membrane, viruses will, some virus will bud into at least one of them. Here's an example of herpes virus uh, budding. Uh, herpes, that you remember, are synthesized in the nucleus. The capsid is made in the nucleus. It buds uh, through the nuclear membrane, acquires a membrane doing that. Then it's got to get out of the ER. So here it is in the ER. So it fuses with the ER membrane. Here it is back in the cytoplasm. It's naked again. It buds into the trans-Golgi, picks up a membrane, then buds again and picks up a second membrane, and finally fuses at the plasma membrane. And now you have your envelope virus. Okay, So a series of budding and unbudding, and budding and fusion steps gives you the final uh, enveloped virus. And the last one, it's got double membrane here at this point, uh, and then it sheds one to, to become the extracellular virus. So here is a, an example of a virus that goes through cellu several membranes, nuclear, ER, Golgi, and plasma membrane to make the final virus. Not all viruses are this complex. And the last step is how do viruses get out of cells? So we've talked a lot about budding. Many viruses are released by budding from the plasma membrane. If they bud into an interior vesicle, they can be taken to the surface and released by the secretory pathway. Uh, other viruses get out by killing the cell, by breaking it open in the cell's lice. Uh, and then they can move from cell to cell. Here's a wonderful picture of the polarized release of HIV from an infected T cell. HIV buds from the plasma membrane. And here's an infected T cell here. And all the virions are being released at one end of the T cell. So it's not, they're not being released all over the plasma membrane. They're released at one side. That's why we call it polarized release. So that's one way that viruses get out of cells. They can be released from the cells, the apical domain of cells. Remember, most cells in your body are polarized. So you can be released from apical domains. You can spread laterally. And, and some viruses do both. And you can also be released from the basal lateral domain, which isn't shown here. So if the virus was released from the apical surface, if this were your lung, it would help the virus to spread by sneezing. And we'll talk about that subsequently. So apical surface release places the virus in the outside world. Uh, if you are released from the basal side, it puts the virus in contact with your circulation. So it can spread in your body and infect other tissues. And that's not good. Uh, and this can happen um, wherever cells are infected. This will influence pathogenesis. Wherever the virus is released, the direction and the mode has enormous consequences on the pathogenesis, which we will talk about in subsequent lectures. Some cells actually break open and release viruses. The bacteriophages, of course, are often lytic, and they lyse bacteria because they encode specific proteins that break the bacteria open. Some viruses do the same. They break their infected cells open. That's the process called lysis. But we really don't, we have really not identified specific viral proteins that do that, as opposed to the bacteriophage proteins that do it. 
We think that many viruses, by inhibiting macromolecular processes and transport, help to kill the cell in this way. Many viruses induce apoptosis, programmed cell death, and that causes lysis as well. Um, there are some specific mechanisms. There is a protease produced by adenovirus, which cleaves intermediate filament proteins of the cell. This probably contributes to cell lysis and facilitates virus release. There's also a glycoprotein that is essential for lysis of cells by adenovirus. If you take this glycoprotein away, genetically the virus does not lyse cells, although we don't know uh, how this works. Finally, I want to share with you a way that some lytic viruses may get out of cells in non-lytic ways. So polio is your quintessential lytic virus. It replicates in cells and pulverizes them in eight hours. They, they fragment and the virus particles are released. But in a fraction of cells, very early on, you can detect viruses being released in the absence of cell killing. And that is because when polio infects cells, it induces a cellular response called autophagy. Autophagy is a response to stress, whereby the cell begins to capture its cytoplasm uh, in these vesicles. So a vesicle derived from uh, the ER forms and surrounds the cytosolic contents. Uh, eventually, these vesicles uh, fuse with lysosomes and then go to the cell surface and release the contents, a way of recycling the cell, if you will, so that the contents can be used. What poliovirus does, it induces autophagy. Well, the cell responds, by, uh, an, by, responds to an infection by uh, inducing autophagy. The virus uses these vesicles to replicate its genomes. And in the process of formation of these vesicles, some virions are captured inside of them, late in infection. And these eventually go to the surface and release the particles in a non-lytic manner. So the, amount, the extent to which this contributes to release is probably minimal, but it could be that in cell, certain cells where lysis doesn't occur, this is a contributing factor. So viruses can lyse cells to release particles. They can release particles by budding, in various, and these both can occur at various parts of the cell, and where it does has consequences for pathogenesis. And there also are non-lytic mechanisms of release for viruses like polio, SV40, which we normally believe to uh, lyse cells. The last example is a fascinating virus isolated from a hot spring in Italy, which is not only 85 to, 95, 85 to 93 degrees in temperature, but it's pH one and a half. So there are places in the world like this. There is a archaea bacteria, a Sidanius convivitor, archaea, and this is a bacteriophage, no, not bacteriophage, this is a virus that infects this archaea, because archaea are not bacteria. So this, this virus looks like this. If you grow it in cell culture, this is what it looks like. It has two tails. This is the mature virus. This is the, this is the nucleic acid here, and it has two tails on either side. If you do an infection of this archaea in the lab at 90 degrees, the virus that's produced from the cell looks like this. Okay, it's not mature. So these are released from the archaea in this form. If you let the, the particles sit in the medium at 90 degrees for an hour or so, they begin to mature into the final particle. So this is all happening extracellularly. It goes from this lemon-shaped particle to this one with the two tails. So everything is in there to complete this maturation. There's no more cell. This is happening extracellularly. So this is a brand new discovery how widespread it is, we don't know, but it's very interesting because this all happens outside of the cell.